was quite the night with Yoon grabbing a very close victory over his liberal rival Lee Jae-myung as South Korea wakes up to the dawn of a new administration due to start, this time under the leadership of a conservative. The political landscape of this nation is forecast to start looking much different in the months and years to come. For more on the election, Yoon's win and its implications, let's get an expert's take on the situation. We connect to Mason Ritchie, professor at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies. Thank you for joining us. Firstly, I want to get your reaction to Yoon's victory. Was this something you had expected? And on An Chol Su's decision to drop out the last minute and back Yoon, do you think that probably nudged him over the line? Uh, yes, I think I, uh, like a lot of other people, um, did expect uh, Yoon to win. The polls were kind of uh, pointing in, in that direction. It ended up being tighter uh, by a significant amount, I think, than, than many of us expected. And yes, I do think that uh, An and um, uh, Yoon merging their campaigns uh, probably made a difference and, and, and presumably helped push um, Yoon over the line. But I think uh, even more than that, uh, we might look at the fact that a quarter of former Moon voters uh, voted for Yoon. Uh, I think that made a difference. Um, and that you know could be uh, a sort of repudiation of some of what uh, Moon has done or, or Moon fatigue, if you will. It might also have something to do with the fact that you know, Lee had a ceiling uh, there was some general unlikability, the Songnam land scandal, um, and perhaps a flip-flopping uh, on uh, several policy measures uh, made him uh, somewhat distasteful uh, to the voting public. Right. And w what do you think are going to be some of the key issues facing soon-to-be President Yoon suk yeol uh, when he takes office? Uh, many people out there say it should be very domestic focused on trying at least to call the overheating housing market, which if you live in South Korea, you know very well about and creating good quality jobs. Do you agree with that? I do. Uh, you, know, you know, normatively, that's what I think people want uh, uh, Yoon to focus on and not just jobs. I mean, you know, the employment figures here um, are, are not so bad per se. Uh, but what's missing are good jobs, uh, stable jobs, uh, and jobs that really sort of fit into um, uh, the the lifestyle and the the ethos uh, that especially young people who are graduating from university uh, you know think that they deserve and for which they feel like they've worked. So good jobs, I think, is really the key. Obviously, uh, the housing ladder um, and making it uh, possible for more people uh, to get into the housing ladder, particularly um, younger people, is going to be. Uh, critical. Uh, other policy issues include COVID, of course. You know, this hasn't gone away. Um, you know, obviously, we've got a few months before Yoon takes office, and we'll see how uh, the Omicron wave um, uh, uh, declines afterwards and, and what the Moon administration does in terms of uh, removing restrictions. Uh, and that will pave the way for Yoon, of course, uh, to, to have his own impact on COVID policy and how that uh, squares with uh, economic policy. Uh, and then also we've got Russia uh, and uh, China. Those are important. Um, you know, there's supply chain issues with both of those countries. In Russia's case, because of the ongoing war, which affects uh, both South Korea's exports and also imports of uh, some products that are important for its economy. Uh, China, of course, is an important um, uh, economic partner for South Korea. And uh, you know, countries all over the world are looking at supply chain diversification away from China, South Korea included. So that's an issue. And then you've got, I think, gender. Uh, issues. That was something that for a lot of uh, females, obviously, was very important in this election and did not feel uh, like it came up uh, enough. So I think he should address that, whether or not he will is a separate question. There's also the question of nuclear phase-out policy. So he has a very full plate in front of him, uh, Yoon does. Yeah, there was some suggestion that he might consider abolishing the uh, family and gender equality uh, ministry and more women voted for his rival in this election. But um, people have been very critical about how both campaigns were run, um, accusing them of rather than explaining their policies clearly, uh, Yoon and Lee Jae-myung uh, spent half their time attacking each other's characters and uh, corruption allegations. Do you think this overall nasty sense of uh, rivalry may have disillusioned a lot of voters? Yeah, so they spend half the time uh, attacking each other and slinging mud and 
uh, the other half of the time, uh, you know, making gaffes and being involved in scandals. Uh, it was a, a really distasteful election. Uh, and I do think uh, people are disillusioned with politics. It did not, however, uh, really depress turnout, which was roughly the same uh, as in 2017. And I would chalk that up uh, to a number of things, the first of which, as I said, are, you know, in some cases, uh, moon voters, I think, sort of repudiating uh, moon policy or simply voting for change. Uh, and then also the other thing is I think a lot of people were motivated by an extreme distaste uh, for one of the two candidates uh, who they thought would be really disastrous uh, for the country. So they perhaps didn't vote so much for the candidate that they loved uh, as much as they voted against the candidate that they hated. Now, this race was incredibly tight. Um, Yoon will be president of South Korea from May, but his party is still going to be in the minority in the National Assembly. Do you think it's going to make it really hard for him to make any headway with his agenda if the Democratic Party are going to just be blocking uh, his every move at the legislative level? I do. Uh, it is going to be hard. Uh, one of the things he's going to have to do uh, right away uh, is get people around him uh, in government, uh, including the prime minister, who has to be confirmed by the National Assembly, which uh, you know does have a majority from uh, the Democratic Party. So his own PPP is a minority party. So that's already going to be a challenge. Uh, and obviously moving his legislative agenda forward uh, up through 2024, uh, when there's the next National Assembly elections, is going to be tough. Uh, the DP will have to be careful uh, a little bit um, in terms of how uh, obstructionist they are. There are municipal elections coming up, uh, I believe, in June or July. Uh, so you know, they won't want to leave uh, too nasty a taste in the voters' mouths for some of these uh, municipal elections. And then, of course, uh, you know, they'll need to, to craft their own obstruction in such a way that it doesn't hurt them uh, in 2024. Uh, for for Yoon's side and for the PPP, I think the uh, temptation is going to, to be to play hardball uh, with the DP, and that includes uh, engaging in retaliation uh, against uh, the members of the current Moon administration. And I think that that um, sets the possibility for a, a kind of a nasty devolving uh, spiral. Uh, yeah, that generally seems to be the case when there's a change of administration from one party to the other, especially here in South Korea. Uh, we must note that life for, for many people in South Korea has been really grinding people down uh, the past few years. We already touched upon the skyrocketing housing prices. There's also the issue of um, employment not meeting people's standards, as you also touched upon, and also the COVID restrictions. Do you expect you to uh, focus a bit more on trying to sort that out over international policies? Uh, I would imagine that you know he's going to take a, a balanced approach. Uh, you know, as as the famous phrase goes, uh, "events, boy, uh, events." You know, the, these things happen uh, sometimes when you're president, and you don't always control your agenda. Um, but I think you know he'll have a balanced approach, and, and obviously at least make an attempt uh, at fixing some of these domestic uh, problems. Uh, but of course, that's going to be really hard, as we just mentioned, because of the composition of the National Assembly. And I think at some point there becomes a sort of a natural inclination uh, to to try to move the rock up the hill that you can. Uh, and, you know, for a president of a presidential system uh, such as South Korea, uh, that often means uh, foreign policy. So there could obviously be events that, uh, you know, drive him to distraction in terms of his policy approaches and looking more internationally. Um, but also, you know, the, the domestic political situation sort of points uh towards that as well. So I think it's going to be a real challenge for, for his team to be able to push through uh, some of these reforms uh, that they would like to see happen. And finally, um, in terms of the relationship uh, Yoon will try and foster um, with um, the countries that South Korea engages with the most diplomatically on the world stage, namely uh, the US, China, Japan, and North Korea. How do you think uh, soon to be President Yoon will uh, try and build relationships with the leaders of those countries. Yeah, so, uh, you know, in the first place, Yoon himself uh, doesn't have much foreign policy experience, really hardly any at all. Uh, but uh, what we know about uh, his team uh, around him in foreign policy is that they're very experienced and they're very competent. Uh, they're also people with whom uh, Washington is very comfortable. Uh, so I expect, uh, you know, A, because of his advisors, B, but B, also because the sort of you know, natural uh, inclination of the, the conservatives here, uh, that Yoon uh, will prioritize working well with the Biden administration, and the Biden administration will clearly welcome that. 
Uh, I expect the alliance, uh, U.S. Rock Alliance, uh, to to expand uh, its scope uh, some and, and not be so parochially focused on the peninsula in North Korea, uh, but also look more uh, regionally and globally, uh, whether that be in the Indo-Pacific or dealing with, for instance, Russia. Uh, I think uh, with Japan, you know, we've seen, you know, historically conservatives tend to try to, to send out some olive branches uh, to Tokyo. And I would imagine that we're going to see the same thing in this case. We'll see how well uh, that is received there uh, under you know, Kishida. Certainly Washington will be encouraging that. That's a very important um, element of uh, U.S. Uh, foreign policy uh, in the region. Uh, and then obviously you have uh, China and North Korea. Those are both very tricky issues. Uh, you know, China clearly, you know, regionally uh, represents uh, a huge trade partner for South Korea. It's number one trade partner, but also uh, is a threat uh, in in many different ways. And the U.S.-China uh, rivalry makes it increasingly difficult for South Korea uh, to uphold uh, both its security relationship with the U.S. and its economic relationship uh, with China. And then with North Korea, you know, Yoon is clearly going to take a, a harder stance. Uh, that's to be expected. Uh, and of course, we just can't forget that North Korea has its own agency here. So to the extent uh, that South Korea is able to to cooperate and engage with North Korea under Yoon, it's not only going to depend or even mostly depend on what it is that Yoon wants to do. It's going to depend quite a bit on uh, what Pyongyang wants. And it's been relatively closed. Uh, and it has been uh, partially because of COVID, partially, I think, because of its own uh, needs and issues. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it's developing its weapons of mass destruction program, including uh, very significant missile testing uh, over the last year. And we can expect uh, those challenges for the UN administration to continue going forward. Well, yeah, he is taking office at a particularly delicate time in terms of uh, the situation in the world right now, it's fair to say. Professor Ritchie, it was a pleasure having you on this newscast with us today. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.